Well, this morning we're continuing our series called Stones, and uh, as we explained a little bit last week, the Bible is filled with all kinds of stories and instances where there's references to stones. You know, there's, uh, it's interesting that there are books that you can purchase that talk about all the men of the Bible, and you can research that, and it's got all the names of every man that ever existed. And then there was a, a second edition, all the women of the Bible, and, and so I wonder if somebody shouldn't write a book called All the Stones of the Bible. Now, they don't all have as many names as those who were included, but again and again, there's this uh, expression of the importance in this place of stones. You know, remember David who picked up the stones to fight to Goliath, and you think again of the, the stones as they crossed the Jordan and uh, set up an altar with the stones that they had pulled out of the middle of the river, and, uh, and uh, the, the stone where Jacob laid his head to sleep at the night. There's uh, another story in Judges, we read about a woman who drops a millstone down on the head of King Ab Abimelech and his head is crushed and, and it's a deliverance of Israel. So stones play kind of a pivotal role in the Bible. This morning the stones we're talking about are the stones that are described for us in John chapter 8. And if you have your Bibles, I hope you do, if you would turn with me to John chapter 8, that would be fantastic. If you don't have a Bible, if you didn't bring one with you, there should be one either in the pew in front of you, perhaps in the seat where you're sitting underneath you. Uh, that's on page 1059 in the pew Bible. Uh, for the rest of you, I don't know what page it's on. So if you would turn with me to John chapter 8. Now, the first thing you may notice there, depending on your translation, is that there is a line and a remark. The remark in my Bible says this, The earliest manuscripts and many other ancient witnesses do not have John 7.53 through 8.11. A few manuscripts include these verses wholly or in part uh, after John chapter 7, verse 36, after John 21, 25, after Luke 21, 38, or Luke 24, verse 53. Now, the statement may cause you to stop. Now, many of you, I suspect, uh, have read that and, and continued on. Uh, some of your Bibles don't have that remark. If you have a King James Version, my guess is that that remark is not included in there. But here in the NIV, in the Revised Standard Version, a number of other versions, that is not, that, that remark is included there. And it makes you stop and consider, for example, this whole idea of biblical translation. As many of you know, the Bible was not originally written in English. This may come as a surprise. It was originally written in Hebrew in the Old Testament. The New Testament consisted of Greek and Aramaic. And so the task of the English translators then was to take the biblical text and translate it from the original languages into the English language. And without going too deep, we're going to begin by a little crash course in what is called textual criticism. As I mentioned, it's written in three languages, and to add to that, we have many parchments, we have many fragments, we have many uh, scrolls that have been the sources that were used to translate the Bible into the language, into the English language. Uh, and most of those are just portions of Scripture. What we don't have is what they call the original autographs of the scriptures. In other words, what the original authors put down to pen and paper or pen and parchment or pen and scroll or whatever they were using. We don't have what they originally wrote. What we have are reliable, transla or, uh, not translations, but uh, copies of the originals. So we don't have what Moses wrote, we don't have what Paul wrote or Peter, but we do have copies of what they wrote, just not their original. It's not like we have their, their diary that says, here it is, this is what I wrote. And uh, instead, what we have are those copies. So the good news is this, that we have an abundance of manuscripts. We have thousands upon thousands. If you consider the difference between the translation process of the Bible compared with, for example, Homer's Odyssey, we have much more reliable evidence that the text that we have is closer to the original sources than any other secular text that we possess. Of course, we also have the Holy Spirit that has enabled the text to be faithfully translated from generation to generation. 
And so with that great number of manuscripts and text and, part, and portions, uh, while we don't have the original autographs, we do have a, a very reliable representation of what they wrote. But there are times when they have to make decisions in the translation process. And uh, imagine, for example, if you had just two manuscripts of the, of the text. And, and one says, for example, that there was an adulterous wo a woman caught in adultery. And the other one says that there is no record of a woman being caught in adultery, well, then you would have to make a decision which one's accurate, which one's not. The good news is, is that there are thousands of manuscripts, and some, many of them have a woman caught in adultery, many of them don't. And what, uh, in this case, which is the story of the woman caught in adultery, is that uh, while we have hundreds and hundreds of manuscripts of John, the majority of those do not include the story of the woman caught in adultery. So this may be one of your favorite stories that doesn't actually occur in the Bible. In fact, the first occurrence of this story in the manuscripts uh, happens in the 5th century A.D. And now, the majority of texts that we have translated from that time add to it. Uh, to add to that, the early church fathers did not, in their commentaries, make any comment on this section of Scripture in John 7, 53 through 81. So they did not have that in their text to make comment on. So what most biblical scholars say is that this probably was not included in John's writings. And so what they do, of course, is they take the age of the text, they take the proximity of the text when they're determining, and they take the number of manuscripts, and then what they do, really, you've got really two trains of thoughts. One would be the King James Version. One would be the NIV, the RSV, other more contemporary versions. What King James does in their translation process is they say the Textus Receptus, otherwise known as the majority text, so they have, this is the one that has the most copies of the text. Now, what the other translators did, they say, well, which is the oldest, which was written closer, which was discovered closer to the place of writing, which was so geographical evidence, numerical evidence, and time of writing is when it was written. So they make a determination, will we include this in the text or not based on majority text or proximity or the science called textual criticism. So that's why there's a little bit of argument in there. Um, so the first manuscripts that we have of this passage, John 7, 53 through 8, uh, 12, were dated about the 5th century. And so this is why that little line there and that, that little note. So now the question comes, do you preach this text or do you not preach this text? As John Piper has said in, his, uh, in a sermon that I checked on him, he happened to say that... Uh, this is one I will not preach very often for these reasons and many of the reasons which I just explained because he, like so many others, do not consider that to be part of the original text. D.A. Carson, he was one of my professors at Trinity, con considered to be one of the world-renowned biblical translators and uh, students of the New Testament. He would say that this, there is no good reason to include this in John. Uh, Metzger, who was world-renowned textual critic, uh, and Bible scholar, he would also agree with that. But both of them come back and what they say is there's no reason to not believe that this event didn't happen in Christ's life. So there's good evidence, they say, that this actually happened, this event of Jesus encountering this adulterous woman. It probably happened, it just was never recorded for us in the book of John or in the book of Luke. So... Uh, so now we look at the text, understanding that the story is probably a story that happened, and there are principles here that can be applied based upon the character that we know of Jesus. Because this isn't a standalone verse or passage. We have lots of surrounding evidence of the nature of who Jesus is, and when you look at this, this certainly speaks to the nature of who Jesus is. So if you look now to John 7, 53, and down into 8.11, or 8.12, uh, we see, then they all went home. So the crowd, the disciples, many people, they went home, but Jesus went on to the Mount of Olives. 
And at dawn, he appeared again in the temple courts, where all the people gathered around him, and he sat down to teach them. The teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought in a woman caught in adultery. And they made her stand before the group and said to Jesus, Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. In the law of Moses, it's commanded us to stone, to, it's commanded to stone such women. Now what do you say? They were using this question as a trap in order to have a basis for accusing him. But Jesus bent down and started to write on the ground with his finger. When they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and said to them, Let any of you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. Again, he stooped down and he wrote on the ground. At this, those who heard began to go away one at a time. The older ones first, until only Jesus was left with the woman standing there. Jesus straightened up and asked her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No, sir, she said. Then neither do I condemn you, Jesus declared. Go now and leave your life of sin. Now, clearly, that sounds something akin to what Jesus would say and what Jesus would do. Because Jesus' reputation was the reputation that he was one who was compassionate to those who were downtrodden and needy. And so, as the story goes, Jesus goes and begins to teach in the temple courts. And then he sits down, and the practice of the teachers in that time would be that they would give a type of sermon, and then they would sit down among the people and begin to explain things. And, and so he begins to teach the people sitting with them. And there he sits, minding his own business, teaching the people when this ruckus begins to occur. And these people come charging in, these men bringing along with them a woman, dragging her along and making her stand there in the center. And as she stands in the midst of the crowd, insults and accusations begin to occur. And they say to Jesus, Teacher, this woman was caught in the very act of adultery. In the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. Now there's a problem there. Because the law of Moses does not say to command such women, but it says to, command, to, to stone both the man and the woman who are caught in adultery. So the question that we need to ask as we read this text, the first question we ask is, where is the man? Now he was either fleet of foot and able to escape in a quick exit, or perhaps the woman was being set up in a position, oh, that's fun. Or perhaps the woman was being set up, perhaps the accusers could care less about what happened to the man because they were more chauvinistic. I mean, we have a number of different options and possibilities that maybe led to the reason that the man wasn't there. But these teachers of the law, in their zeal, they come running, and the Pharisees, considered to be experts in God's law, begin to say, this is God's command, but they leave out that little part because it served their agenda. They weren't, weren't concerned about the woman, and they honestly weren't concerned about the law. They were concerned about an agenda. Now look at verse 5. It says, in the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. It's, it's, it's not just women. And so they had bent God's word to advance their agenda. I would caution you against doing that. We need to consider God's word in its entirety. We need to consider God's law for all. And that's part of the problem we see here, is when we begin to project what is expected of others without considering what is expected of us, there can be a problem. Sin, uh, adultery is not a sin that occurs in isolation. So the Pharisees, they bring a woman, but no man. And Jesus begins to address them, and it says why, that, why they brought him, right? It says that they might trap him. So there's their agenda. So they create a narrative that this woman caught in adultery should be stoned, where the law actually says that both should be stoned. Not for the sake of the woman, not for the sake of the law, but that they might trap Jesus. And so not only do they abuse God's law, but they abuse this woman. 
They put her in the public in the public square before all these people. Now, was she guilty? It would appear so, based upon later where it says that when Jesus says, go and sin no more, that indeed the woman had had a reputation. It's not certain, though, because who was the accuser of this woman? She was caught in the very act of adultery. I suspect that indeed she was caught in the act. But that was only half the story. And regardless of the crimes of the woman, we have this desire within us to be sympathetic to the woman. I think as we read that, that's our natural course, our natural direction, our natural understanding is that, that, the, the, that this woman is being taken advantage of. Because in verse 6, again, they were using her, they were using God's word to advance their purposes. They were using it as a trap, as they questioned Jesus, in order to have a basis for accusing him. That was their intent. It wasn't a concern for a law. It wasn't a concern for a woman, but it was a trap to accuse Jesus. To accuse him of what? Well, how quick they distort God's word and how quickly they distort the image of God in this woman and for what purpose? To trap Jesus. So what's Jesus to do? To, not, to, to deny the law, Jesus would quickly have undermined his, undermined his credibility because if he said, well, that's the Mosaic law, we don't practice that anymore, it would have undermined his authority to those to whom he was teaching because that was the very purpose of him sitting down was to teach the scriptures to the people. And if he had said, these scriptures are not accurate, these scriptures are not relevant to us today, his authority would have been undermined. Now, on the other hand, if he had upheld the law, it would have been a largely unpopular decision among the people. And certainly Jesus wasn't compelled by the, 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 the popular opinion of the day, but by and large, stoning had not occurred in the first century. It was the exception, not the rule. And third consequence of Jesus' actions could have been this that if he had said, let's stone the woman, and, and pronounced a verdict upon her that she should be uh, stoned and killed and capital punish carried out, that was the responsibility of the Roman government, so he would have been in trouble with the Roman government. So their attempt was to trap Jesus, I think probably even more so to the point that they thought they would, that he would stand up and hold up the law as the flag of which they should follow in the event that the Romans then would have opportunity to arrest him, that he might be accused. So what is Jesus to do? Instead of picking up a stone, Jesus spins down, and he begins to scribble on the ground, and that's been a question for centuries of what is Jesus writing, and I don't have an answer for you any better than anybody else. There's been lots of uh, suggestions you know, talking about these men will go to dust under God's judgment because they have failed to heed God's law. Uh, others have suggested that Jesus was bending down, writing down the Ten Commandments, maybe even making a little pointer arrow to this person because he dropped the ball there and sinned over here. There's lots of suggestions. It really, it, it just doesn't tell us. But we do know as Jesus bent down and he began to write. I don't think he was making emojis in the sand. I believe there was probably some revelation of the sins that the men around them had, had uh, carried out themselves. But what we do know is this, is that when Jesus stands up, he says this, let any of you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. This morning is on Facebook, I was reading a quote by Timothy Keller, church out in uh, a pastor out at a church in New York, and he says, one thing that we must do is realize just how sinful and, de and depraved we are. It's beyond what we've ever imagined. And then the second part, he says, but realize the grace and the goodness of God, because that, too, is beyond what you have ever imagined. But the first part here is we need to realize our sinfulness. Let any of you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. Now, Jesus doesn't call for sinless perfection here. That's not what he's calling for. He isn't expecting from each of us to be 
without sin entirely. If that were the case, then, first, then John wouldn't have written in 1 John that if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. Because the truth is that we all sin. Even as Christians, we will sin. And yet at the same time, we have a responsibility to be true to God's word. So that's not the expectation. He isn't saying that there needs to be sinless, ex, sinlessness, but what he is saying is that you can't be guilty. Now, the expectation in the Old Testament law was that when a sin occurred, one that was worthy of someone being stoned to death, whether that be uh, blasphemy against God or whether that be adultery, that there was a witness. And the first person who would cast the stone was the one who witnessed the event. So what Jesus is doing here is drawing us back to the law, saying that the person who witnessed this event, now there was a second expectation, and it was that that person himself would be disconnected from the sin that occurred. Which, in a way, suggests that in this text that there was a little bit more involvement of the Pharisees and the scribes in the situation where they had some responsibility in this setup, in this trap. But beyond that, of course, is the reality that we each have our own sins to deal with and our own concerns that we have to take before God. And now these men, convicted by their own conscience, begin to leave. And it starts with the oldest. And I think there's an important lesson there, too. Because we can be quick to condemn the scribes, and we can be quick to condemn the Pharisees. But remember, they were experts in the law of God. They knew the Bible, trust me, certainly the Old Testament, better than most of us. Experts. But they walked away. Instead of allowing their pride to get the best of them, they walked away. Instead of digging in and getting a foothold, they walked away. The truth is, they were never seeking justice. They were seeking to trap Jesus. But you know that in the presence of Jesus, convicted by their own conscience, by the, own, by the Spirit of God, I su suspect, that they walked away. They realized their own sinful nature, and rather than picking up a stone in their self-righteousness, they walked away. And now here in verse 10, we come to the crux of the story, and Jesus asks, woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? And turning around, I just wonder what went through her mind at that moment, if, if she had had her head down in shame for up up to this moment, not even realizing what had gone on around her. And now as she looks around, there is no one there to accuse her. And Jesus replies, then neither do I condemn you. Go now and leave your life of sin. You know, Jesus did not ask if the woman was guilty. That wasn't his question. Woman, did you do what they said you did? No, Jesus said, where are those who condemn you? Her lifestyle clearly suggested that there was something that she was guilty of. And the question was, has no one condemned you? You know, in John chapter 3, verse 17, we read, For God did not send his Son into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through him. So here stands Jesus, not condemning the woman, but offering her a chance at salvation. A chance for a new beginning. It's the law given through Moses that brought condemnation. It was the law that revealed to us the need for salvation. It was the law that showed us that we are sinners in need of a Savior. The law could not save. The law only brings condemnation. These experts in the law, it's no wonder that, that their desire was to pick up the stone. But now they stand, they've walked away, and Jesus stands there and says, I do not condemn you. In John chapter 12, verse 47, Jesus says, I did not come to judge the world, but to save the world. This is why Jesus came. Now granted, there's a day yet to come when Jesus will return to judge the living and the dead. There is a day when we will stand before him and make an account 
But it's not our righteousness with which we stand before Jesus. It's his righteousness received by faith when we receive the gift that he offers to us because of the death he died on the cross. See, there's this great news in Romans 8, verse 1, that says there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And that is what satisfies the law because Jesus did not come to condemn the law, but to fulfill the law. So the righteousness that we could not achieve by trying to keep the law was achieved through Jesus who came into this world as a human who died on the cross without sin to pay the penalty for what we deserve that we might have righteousness, that our condemnation might be done away with. For all who receive him, to him he gives the right to become children of God. Relationships are restored. Our place with God is returned. Condemnation is no more. The scribes and the Pharisees came as judge and executioners. But their motives were heartless. They did not have compassion. They did not have mercy. They did not express grace. That is what Jesus gives to us, is mercy and grace. That is the good news of the gospel, is that we are not dead in our trespasses and sins, but that we have hope through Jesus Christ. Have you experienced the grace of Jesus? I've often asked, asked people this question in times of counseling or whatever, uh, in the like, and uh, I'll ask him this question. When you see the face of God, take a minute, imagine the face of God, and when you see the face of God, what is the look he has upon his face? And here's what I think we do, is we take the look of the Pharisees and the scribes and we assign that to Jesus, a look of judgment, a look of uh, uh, condemnation, of disappointment, of anger, of wrath. And yes, Jesus will come one day with his wrath to establish his kingdom on earth, to destroy those who have rebelled against him. But the face that he has for those who have received him is one of grace and mercy and love and acceptance. It's not condemnation, but it's hope. It's easy to see the face of the Pharisees, isn't it? And so often we live in a world where we see those faces around us. Faces of condemnation. But have you accepted the payment that Jesus paid on the cross? When Jesus hung on the cross, the last word he said is to tell us that, which means it is finished. It's an accounting term. It means the debt is paid in full. The debt that you owed for your sin was paid on the cross. For as many as receive him, they have the right to be called children of God. It's a complete and utter identity transformation this woman went from the identity of being an adulterous woman to being a child of God. Have you come to that place in your life where you have received the forgiveness of God? And if you have, and perhaps you're a Christian and you still have sin, the promise in 1 John is if you confess your sins, he will forgive you your sins. Because he wants you to come to him. He doesn't want you to hide in shame. He wants you to come and confess and receive his forgiveness. Because he does not come to condemn, but to save. That was his purpose for coming. Perhaps you failed to heed his call and sin no more. That was the instruction to the woman. Go and sin more, no more. You see, what he's not saying is if you come to me, you can go and do as you please. That was a misconception for the Romans. In Romans chapter 6, that was the question they asked. Shall we continue to sin that grace may increase? What that means is, hey, Jesus forgives me for my sin. I'll experience more forgiveness if I sin more. And the response of Paul in Romans 6 is, may it never be. How shall we who died to sin continue to live in it? Here to the adulterous woman, Jesus says, go and sin no more. We have this response when we experience the grace of Jesus that says, I will go now and live a life of sinning no more. No longer will I be predispositioned. No longer will my orientation be towards sin. But instead, my orientation will be for Christ and living a life worthy of the calling of God in Christ Jesus. So we go back and we live our lives to the best of our ability, but we understand that there will be times that we sin. But it's not a lifestyle of sin. That's what he's speaking of. Don't live a lifestyle of sin, but live a lifestyle of grace and mercy and understand you've been forgiven that you will no longer turn to those things because you realize how desperate you were for a Savior and you've been saved. So live as one who is saved.
Christian artist David Crowder, he's put it this way in a song. The song is called Lift Your Head, Weary Sinner. I like some of these verses. It says, Lift your head, weary sinner. The river's just ahead. Down the path of forgiveness, salvation's waiting there. You built a mighty fortress, 10,000 burdens high. Love is here to lift you up, here to lift you high. If you're lost and wandering, come stumble in like a prodigal child. See the walls start crumbling. Let the gates of glory open wide. All who've strayed and walked away, unspeakable things you've done, fix your eyes on the mountain. Let the past be dead and gone. Come, all saints and sinners, you can't outrun God. Whatever you've done can't overcome the power of the blood. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Come experience the grace of God. Come experience the mercy of God. Come experience the forgiveness of God if you have not received those things. And then let the rest of us live our lives in such a way that we extend the grace of God and the mercy of God and the forgiveness of God to the sinners around us who are lost and who have built a tower of burdens which they cannot bear. Instead of condemnation, let us show the love of Christ to a world in need. Will you pray with me? Lord, we were lost and lonely sinners standing in the face of con staring in the face of condemnation. Because that's what we deserve for what we have done. The wages of our sin was death. That's what we deserved. Honestly, that's what this adulterous woman deserved was death. But here she experiences the grace and the mercy of Jesus who came not to condemn but to save. Lord, if there's someone here today who has never received Jesus Christ and his forgiveness, experienced his grace and mercy, may today be the day of their salvation. If that's you today, it may be something as simple that you say in prayer to God, something as simple as, God, I'm a sinner. I need a Savior. I surrender my life to you today that I might go and sin no more. If that's you today, let me encourage you to just let us know through the connection card. For the rest of us, Lord, may we live with grace and mercy and forgiveness. May the face that they see upon us is the, 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 the face of receiving as Jesus received this woman. The, the face of forgiveness as Jesus forgave this woman. Rather than parading people around as sinners, may we parade them around as saved. Lord, may our Savior's Baptist Church continue to share that hope that is found in Christ. The good news that Jesus is a God who forgives and welcomes the sinner that we might be saved. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.